ethath and an honest bath. Now, an ethath and a bath is a unit of measurement. Let me explain why they go into the scale business, okay? Crooked merchants had two sets of scales. The scale was like the balance beam scale. You've seen those. You see the statue that's, you know, justice is blind, and she's holding the scales in her hands, and the scale is a balance beam where you take evidence in your way on one side and evidence on the other, and a preponderance of the evidence is which way the scales go up or down according to how much is in each side. Well, see, if you were a slick merchant or a tax collector, you had two sets of scales, see? You had one set of scales that was off balance so that somebody you were selling, so that you were uh, buying something from or selling to, the scale would weigh heavier on one side than the other. And then when it was to your advantage, you took out the other pair of scales and it was weighted the other direction so that you paid less. And what he's saying here is, I'm telling you, the government will be absolutely honest and they will not allow there to be uneven scales. Everything will be just and honest and true and everybody will, be, will have their business conducted by the same weight and measure. Sounds like a flat tax to me. Amen? It really does. Everybody pays the same. All right? It goes on. The ethath and, and the bath shall be of the same measure, so that the bath contains one-tenth of a homer and the ethath one-tenth of a tenth of a homer. Their measures shall be according to the, uh, to the homer. The shekel shall be 20 geras, 20, shek 20 shekels, 25 shekels, and 15 shekels shall be your minor. This is the offerings which you shall offer. You shall give one sixth of an oath of, of an ofa of, uh, 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 from a homer of wheat and one sixth of an ephah from a homer of barley. In other words, when you're making an offering, you're not to be ripped off in the sanctuary. Let that one soak in. And stay away from Joel Holstein. <laughs> the ordinance concerning oil and the bath of oil is one-tenth of a bath from a core. A core is a homer and ten baths, for ten baths are a homer. And one lamb shall be given from the flock of two hundred, from the rich pastors of Israel, these shall be for grain offerings, burnt offerings, and peace offerings to make atonement for them, says the Lord God. Now this is being said to who? Jews. When you hear about only taking one lamb from 200, what story immediately comes to mind? King David. Do you remember? Nathan came to him and said, King, there's a matter that requires your attention. Remember the story? He says, there was a man who only had one sheep and he loved that sheep and he nurtured that sheep and lived together with him and his family in his house. And a rich man was gonna throw a feast for his friends. And so he went to the house of the man that only had one sheep, even though the rich man had tons of sheep. And he took the man's sheep and he killed it. And he left that family with nothing. David heard that and he was outraged. And he said, surely that man will die. And Nathan looked at him and he said, my king, thou art the man. They had known what it was to see someone they had truly honored fail them and be corrupt. And what's being said here, what's being said is that there will be fairness from your government in the millennial kingdom. He goes on. 
All the people of the land shall give this offering for the prince of Israel. Then it shall be the prince's part to give burnt offerings, grain offerings, and drink offerings at the feast, the new moons, the Sabbath, and at all the appointed seasons of the house of Israel. He shall prepare the sin offering, the grain offering, the burnt offerings, the peace offerings, and to make atonement for the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, in the first month of the first day of the month, you shall take a young bull without blemish and cleanse the sanctuary. The priest shall take some of the blood of the sin offering and put it on the doorpost of the temple and on the four corners of the ledge of the altar and on the gatepost of the gate of the inner court. And so you shall shall do on the Sabbath day of, uh, of the month, on the seventh day of the month, for everyone who has sinned unintentionally or in ignorance, thou shall, th thus you shall make atonement for the temple. In the first month of the 14th day of the month, you shall observe Passover, a feast of seven days. Unleavened bread shall be eaten. And on the day of the uh, day, the prince shall prepare himself for all the people of the land a bull for a sin offering on the seven on the seven days of the feast he shall prepare a burnt offering to the lord seven bulls seven rams without blemish daily for seven days and a kid of the goats daily for a sin offering hold that idea daily sin offering now jesus has already died the blood of bulls and goats means nothing anymore. He's looking for the light bulb to go off in the minds of the Jews, looking at Jesus and looking at them. Do you realize that the only handicapped person that's going to be in heaven, the only person with any physical blemish is going to be Jesus? Five foot six Jewish carpenter. And the scripture says we'll know him because of the nail prints in his hand. Everybody else, we're going to have new bodies. We're all going to be completely healed. And we'll know and we'll see and we'll remember. These people will see the offerings and they will remember. And it'll bring many to salvation. And he shall prepare a grain offering of one ethaph for each bull and one ethaph for each ram, together with a kin of oil for each ethaph. In the seventh month, on the fifteenth day of the month, at the at the feast, you shall do likewise for the seven days according to the sin offering, the burnt offering, and the grain offering, and the offering and the oil. We're on the home, str home stretch here. Forty six. Thus says the Lord God: the gateway of the inner court that faces toward the east shall be shut the six working days but on the seventh day it shall be open and on the day of the new moon it shall be open the prince shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gate from the outside and stand by the gatepost the priest shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offerings he shall worship at the threshold of the gate then he shall go out but the gate shall not be shut until evening and likewise the people of the land shall worship at the entrance of the gateways before the Lord on the Sabbath and the new moons. The burnt offerings that the prince offers to the Lord on the Sabbath day shall be six lambs without blemish and a ram without blemish. And the grain offering shall be one ethath for a ram. And the grain offering for the lambs as much as he wants to give as well as a hint of oil with every ethath. And on the day of the new moon, it shall be a young bull without blemish, six lambs and a ram. They shall be without blemish. He shall prepare a grain offering of an ephah for a bull, an ephah for a ram, and as much as he wants to give for the lambs, and a hin of oil with every ephah. And when the prince enters, he shall go in by way of the vestibule of the gateway and to go out the same way. But when the people of the land come before the Lord on the appointed feast days, whoever enters in one way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the way of the south gate. And whoever enters by way of the south gate shall go out by the north gate. 
He shall not return by way of the gate through which he came, but shall go out through the opposite gate. You know what all that, I believe, has to do with? Anybody who enters into the temple can't leave by the same door they came in by. It's just like true worship. When you come together for true worship, you ought to go out different than you came in. If you're not going someplace where you're getting fed in the Word, and that includes here, find someplace else to go where you are fed. If you're not able to worship where you're at, take a good look at yourself and then find some place where you can worship. You ought, to, you ought to leave different than you came in. It ought to mean something. You might say that's not much of a way to build a church. Well, when I was in seminary, they told us all about how to build an organization. I'd, I'd rather do something for God. The prince shall then be in their, in their midst. And when they go in, he shall go in. And when they go out, he shall go out. At the festivals and the appointed feast days, the grain offering shall be an ethaph for a bull, an ethaph for a ram, as much as he wants to give for the lambs, and a hin of oil, with every ephah. Now, when the prince makes a voluntary burnt offering or, off, or voluntary peace offering to the Lord, the, gates, the gate that faces toward the east shall then be opened for him. And he shall prepare his burnt offering and his peace offerings as he did on the Sabbath day. Then he shall go out and enter. Uh, and after he uh, goes out to the gate, out the gate will be shut you shall daily make burnt offerings to the lord for a lamb uh, of a lamb of the first year without blemish you shall prepare it every morning and that was the custom forever the only difference is if you read leviticus they made an offering in the morning and the evening there's no evening offering in this perhaps because it typifies there's no night of sin there isn't any of that it's just in the morning to remind the people of Jesus. And you shall prepare a grain offering with it every morning, a sixth of, of an ephah and a third of a, shin, a, a hen of oil to moisten the fine flour. This grain offering is a perpetual ordinance to be made regularly to the, to the Lord. Thus they shall prepare a lamb, a grain offering, and, uh, and the oil as a regular burnt offering every morning. Thus says the Lord God, if the prince gives a gift, now listen to this, if a prince gives a gift, uh, if the prince gives a gift of some of his inheritance, <coughs> remember the prince gets a specific piece of real estate and no more. If he gets that as a part of his inheritance and he gives it to any of his sons, it shall belong to its sons in their possession by an inheritance. In other words, when the, he dies, they get to keep the land. It's an inheritance that he gives them. But if he gives it to some of uh, some of his, if he gives a gift of some of his inheritance to one of his servants, it shall be his until the year of liberty. That's the year of jubilee, once every fifty years. After which it shall return to the prince but his inheritance shall belong to his sons. It becomes theirs. You say, now what is he talking about? This is after Jesus comes back to set up his millennial reign. If you remember when we studied the book of Revelation, we found that there were three classes of people that were there during the millennium. Those that come to believe in Jesus and accept him as Lord and Savior before the rapture, before the tribulation period, Scripture said that we are called sons. Now, some women get offended at that. They say, what do you mean? How come that's always sons? They always exclude women. Well, you know what? He calls me part of the bride of Christ. He calls women sons, you're a son, okay? Guys, he calls us brides, okay? Get over it. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it, okay? He's talking about us. All right. So at any rate, 
He calls us sons. He's saying that we're family, that he's going to give it to us. But we found that there was also people who were going to be saved during the, middle, the, during the tribulation period. And those that were saved during the tribulation period would die for their faith because they wouldn't accept the mark of the beast. He called them servants. Remember Jesus said, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. It's a difference. And then the third group of people <coughs> were Jews who got saved. Those are the 144,000. Three different groups of people. And here he speaks of an inheritance that's given of the real estate to servants. That reverts back at the year of Jubilee, once every 50 years, during that thousand year period. But to sons, it's permanent. All right? Moreover, the prince shall not take any, take any of the people's inheritance by evicting them from their property. He shall provide an inheritance for his sons from his own property so that none of my people may be scattered from his property. Somebody get this to Congress as fast as you can. In fact, get it to the state in which you live. No matter what, they cannot take your property. If God gives it to you, no one can take it for taxes or any other reason. It's private, personal property awarded by God. And no governmental agency may take it from you in a just governmental setting. It's right here. It's right here. What does that tell you about the way our laws are deteriorating? All right. And that's not 3 Samuel. It's right here. Now, he brought me through the entrance, which was at the side of the gate, into the holy chambers of the priest, which faced toward the north. And there, a place was situated at the extreme western end. And he said to me, this is the place where the priest shall boil the trespass offering and the sin offering and there they shall bake the grain offering so that they do not bring them uh, out into the outer court to sanctify the people then he brought me out into the outer court and caused me to pass by the four corners of the court and in fact in every corner of the court there was another court in the four corners of the court were enclosed courts 40 cubits long, 30 cubits wide. All four corners were the same size. There was a row of buildings, building stones all around them. All around the four of them and cooking hearts were made under the, the rows of the stones all around. And he said to me, these are the kitchens where the ministers of the temple shall boil the sacrifices of the people. 47, chapter 47. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east in front of the temple faced east. Now, if you remember, Jesus is going to touch down when he comes back where? On the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is where in relationship to the temple? East. There's a big deal made about him coming back through the eastern gate. The Muslims assuming that when they talk about the Eastern Gate, they are talking about the Eastern Gate of the wall that currently exists in Israel, have made a stone wall blocking the gate. And in addition to that, remember what it said to the priests? That if you touch a dead body or go through an area where dead bodies are buried, then you have to be sanctified for seven days. They put a graveyard in front of the place that they put a stone wall. There's only one problem. They didn't read the whole scripture. There have been more than one wall in that area. That's not the wall it's talking about. This is talking about an eastern gate and a temple that's yet to be built. So at any rate, their best efforts aren't working out. 
itself. Muslims aren't going to be able to stop it. But it does tell you how much they fear this prophecy. All right. Second verse. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gateway that faces the east. And there was water running out on the right side. And when the man went out to the east with a line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits and he brought me through the waters and water came up to my ankles. Get the picture. This water is running out from the altar of the temple. And as it runs out, it's a little bit of water. And the little bit of water, when he gets out, a thousand, whatever it was, from there, he, he tells him, go ahead. And Ezekiel steps out in the water and it's up to his ankles. Look what happens as this water, a symbol of the Holy Spirit and the blessings of God, sweeping out from the altar. All blessings of God start by the, with the applied blood of Jesus. They all do. And watch what happens when they proceed from the altar. Third verse. And when the man went out to the east with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my ankles. And again he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my knees. And again he measured 1,000 and brought me through, and the water came up to my waist. And again he measured 1,000. It went as a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim, a river that could not be could not be crossed. Do you know what he's saying? When you start at the altar and you're washed in the blood of Jesus, when you continue in the flow of the Holy Spirit, the blessings become so deep that they're over your head. The relationship with God becomes so deep deep when you made the effort to be close to him. He says, you draw nigh to me, I'll draw, I'll draw near to you. That's what he says. And when you do, he'll flood you. It's the word of God. He said to me, son of man, have you seen this? And then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. And when I returned there along the bank of the river, were many, were very many trees on one side and the other. And he said to me, the water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley and enters the sea. And when it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. How do you like that? Dead sea is going to be healed. Right now, fish can't even live in it. And it shall be that very living thing that moves wherever the rivers go will live. Wherever the Spirit of God touches, things will come alive. There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. It shall be that fishermen will stand by it from En Gedi to En Eglan, they will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kinds as the fish in the great sea, exceedingly many. But its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. Along the bank of the river on this, on this side and that will grow all kinds of trees used for food, and their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. In other words, no picking season. They'll grow fruit year-round. Israel is going to be provided with an abundance of fish. They're going to be provided with an abundance of produce, and they'll have it all the time. Listen what it says. Their fruit will be for food, and their leaves for medicine. And why is this going to happen? The sentence before they will bear fruit every month because their water flows from the sanctuary. Because the waters 
the Holy Spirit will flow through them and they'll constantly bear fruit, they'll constantly be fish, and the people will constantly be provided for. Thus says the Lord God, these are the borders by which you shall divide the land of an inheritance among the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph shall have two portions. You shall inherit it equally one with one another, for I raised my hand in an oath to give it to your fathers, and this land shall, shall fall, in, uh, fall to you as your inheritance. Now, there's a message there, folks. You don't hold God. God holds you. There, is a, there are promises for God for your life. And those promises for God are in that larger vision of things to come. If your whole vision of your life with God is just focused on the problems in your life right now, then your relationship with God has been reduced to one of a genie in a lamp where you do everything you possibly can out of your own flesh, your own works, and your own strength to make things work out, and then as a last resort, you rub the lamp, and sometimes God pops out like a genie and fixes your stuff, and sometimes he doesn't. When your vision is broad, and you see that his promises are real, and that no matter what trouble you find yourself in today, their promises to you for the future. When you have that view, things work out. The relationship becomes strong and full. When you believe that all things work together, even the bad stuff that's happening to you today, all things work together for good, that them that love God and are called according to his purpose. Romans 8.28 Amen. This shall be the border of the land on the north, from the great sea by the road uh, to Hinlon that goes to, to Zedad. Hamath, Vera, Sibrain, which is between the border of Damascus and the border of Hamath, to Hazar, Halicon, which is on the border of Huran. This is the bound, this Thus the boundary shall be from the sea to Hazar Iran, and the border of Damascus as far uh, north northward is the border of Hamath. This is the north side. On the east side you shall mark out the border uh, between Hanan and Damascus and between Gilead and the land of Israel along the Jordan and along the eastern side of the sea. This is the east side. So, troop between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. The south side toward the south shall be from Tamar to the waters of Meribah by Kadesh, along the brook to the Great Sea. This is the south, this is the south side toward the south. The west side shall be the Great Sea from the southern boundary until one comes to the point opposite Hamath. This is the side to the west. Thus you shall divide the land among yourselves according to the tribes of Israel. It shall be that you will divide it by, the, by lots as an inheritance for, the, for yourselves and for the strangers who dwell among you, who bear children among you. They shall be to you as native born among the children of Israel and they shall have an inheritance among the tribes of Israel. Um, in this last, the answer to the Palestinian problem, the answer to what's going on now with the uprising of the Jordanians called Palestinians in the south, the friction between them and Israel, Jesus has an answer to that. And it's contained in this last verse. This is what Jesus is going to do about those who are Jordanians that are living outside of Israel who want their own homeland. Listen to the instructions that he gives to Israel. 
and it shall be that in whatever tribe a stranger dwells, there you will give him an inheritance, says the Lord God. In other words, under a just government, under Jesus, he will give any that are there a piece of land wherever they dwell. He will not leave them out. That's the answer to the Palestinian problem. And it's going to happen. Last chapter, he just, it just describes how the land's going to be divided. Now these are the names of the tribes from the northern border along the road to Hethon at the entrance of Hamath to Hazar, Enan, and the borders of Damascus. Northward in the direction of Hamath, there shall be one section of Dan from its east to its west side. By the border of Dan from the east side to the west, one, se one section for Asher. By the border of Asher from the east side to the west, one section for Naphtali. By the border of Naphtali from the east side to the west, one section for Manasseh. By the border of Manasseh from the east side to the west, one section for Ephraim. By the border of Ephraim to the east side of the west, one section for Reuben. By the border of, of Reuben from the east side to the west, one section for Judah. By the border of Judah from the east side to the west shall be the district which you shall set apart 25,000 cubits in width and in length, the same as the one of the other possessions from the east side to the west with the sanctuary in the center. The district that you shall set apart for the Lord shall be 25,000 cubits in length and 10,000 in width. To these, to the priests, to the holy district shall belong on the north 25,000 cubits in length, on the west 10,000 in width, to the east 10,000 in width, and on the south 25,000 in length. The sanctuary of the Lord shall be in the center, and it shall be for the priests and the sons of Zadok who are sanctified, who have kept my charge, who did not go astray, when the children of Israel went astray, as the Levites went astray. And this district of land is set apart, shall be to them a thing most holy by the border of the Levites. Opposite the border of the priest, the Levites shall have an area 25,000 cubits in length and 10,000 in width. Its entire length shall be 25,000 and its width 10,000 and they shall not sell or exchange any of it, and they may not alienate the best part of the land, for it is holy to the Lord. The 5,000 cubits in width that remain along the edge of the 25,000 shall be for general use by the city, for dwellings in common land, and the city shall be in the center. These shall be its measurements on the north side, 4,500 cubits, the south side, 4,500, on the east side, 4,500, and on the